Mark chapter 4, the Gospel of Mark chapter 4, verse 1 to 20. Another one of the parables that is known to a lot of us. And over the past few weeks, we've been looking at some of Jesus' parables and the things that he spoke about. And hopefully, it's not just something, a story that Jesus just spoke about in the Gospels, but hopefully, through them, he's been teaching us about our life, this life. Some of us have been sitting with, the, with these parables and studying them to find out what we could be learning from them. And of all the parables that Jesus told, there is one, one, only one, about which Jesus said, if you don't understand this one, you're not going to understand any of the other ones. And that's the parable that we're going to be looking at today, found in Mark chapter 4. And as we discuss this together, and as we've been thinking about it together, we're going to also sit this morning and try and figure out what is Jesus saying in this parable. Thankfully, thankfully, in this particular one, he actually explains it to his audience of the first century and to us. But also, how do we apply this to our lives? Because I believe that when we do that, it has the power, it has the ability to change the way we see our lives and to change the way we see the world around us. The way we see our world and the way we live our lives day after day. So the story that we're going to be looking at today comes from the Gospel of Mark. At this point in Jesus' life, Jesus has already started to gain quite a lot of momentum, a lot of following. People were hearing that he was the kind of guy who would cast out demons and somebody who could heal people and could heal the sick. And somebody, when the religious leaders would come to him, they sort of came with a bit of fear um, and trepidation and trembling a little bit because he would constantly challenge the status quo. People would come asking Jesus what he's going to do next. What is, what is he going to say next? And the author of Mark starts in chapter 4 in verse 1 saying, Jesus began to teach beside the lake again. Such a large crowd gathered that he literally had to climb onto a boat that was there on the lake. He sat in the boat while the whole crowd was nearby on the shore. He said many things to them in parables. While teaching them, he said, listen to this. A farmer went out to scatter seeds. And he, he was scattering those seeds. Some fell on the path and the birds came and ate it. Others a seed fell on rocky ground where the soil, were, where the soil was very shallow. They sprouted immediately because the soil wasn't deep. But when the, the sun came, uh, came up, it literally destroyed the plants. And they dried up because they had no roots. Other seeds fell among thorny plants. The thorny plants grew and choked the seeds, and they produced nothing. Other seeds fell into good soils and bore fruit. Upon growing and increasing, the seeds produce in one case a yield of 30 to 1, in another case a yield of 60 to 1, and in another case a yield of 100, 100 to 1. I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine for a second that you were one of these people who heard about Jesus. You are one of those people who thought, let me come a little bit early so I can stand in the front and not try to listen to Jesus in the back. I want you to imagine that you uh, find yourself out trying to find out what Jesus is going to say. You're hearing these words, the thing that Jesus was talking about and teaching about it. You've heard it say to you, but this time you are in the crowd. You hear that he was saying these things that are just mind-blowing before, and so you are really ready, and you go and you hear for yourself, and you may be even sitting at the edge of your seat, 
Like you're probably saying, oh, what is he going to do next? What is he going to say next? Because I've heard so much about him. And he starts talking about a farmer throwing seeds. And you think to yourself, okay, okay, I can handle that. I know enough about that. I've, I've heard about that. Or I've seen it. Or I've done it myself. And you, you think to yourself, okay, let's carry on. Let's see what he tells us. Let's, let's see what Jesus is going to do next. And he tells a story and he ends by saying the seeds that landed in good soil grew and it bore fruit. Those who hear should listen and understand. And then he leaves. What do you think they might be thinking at that moment? They were probably saying, okay, okay, we, you mean we came for that? Is that the best you've got, Jesus? Is that the best story you have? We heard about all these other stuff. Seeds in good soil, growing bear fruit like that. Of course, come on, really? There has to be more to that. And oftentimes there was more to that. And in, a ca- in this case, there was more. The people heard that and they went home, but still some continued to follow Jesus. And so we pick up in verse 10 of chapter 4. And it says this. When they were alone, those are the people who didn't go home and follow Jesus. When they were alone, this is Jesus and the people who continued to follow. The people around Jesus along with the twelve asked him about this parable. I mean, imagine this for a moment. Sort of like one of those moments maybe... And your spouse or at work where you know you are supposed to know an answer to something but you don't actually remember what it was you also don't want the person who you should know the thing about to know that you actually don't know anything about them in this case I want you to picture Peter he's one of Jesus closest followers Coming up and saying, Jesus, great parable today, by the way. I really love that one. If it was one about the farmer, was really, really good. I really understood this, Jesus. But James and John over there just keep arguing about this. They keep on arguing about this particular story. You know how brothers are, and James and John are just doing it. They're arguing. They just don't like to get along. And... So, I try to explain it to them, Jesus, and they're not really listening, they're not really getting this. And Jesus says, as we continue to read, Jesus says, the secret of God's kingdom has been given to you. But to those who are outside, everything comes in this parable. This is so that you can look and see, but have no insight, and they can hear but not understand. Otherwise, he says, they might turn their lives around and be forgiven. Now, if you grew up in a church and you grew up singing the song, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so, and Jesus loves little children, all the children of the world, so you had an idea of who Jesus is, and that he is most loving, welcoming, and caring guy who ever lived, right? Then you read this passage, like this where Jesus saying, they can hear, but not understand. Otherwise, they might turn their lives around and be forgiven. This doesn't really mesh up with your idea of Jesus is, who Jesus is, or who you grew up to believe Jesus to be as a little child. It actually kind of troubles you a little bit. Anytime you have those moments in your faith, it's always important to sort of dig deeper and ask. Never just turn away because you don't understand. Dig deeper. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you if you're doing a Bible study or if you're doing a devotion. Send me a text, phone me, ask me, ask any of the other pastors. But we need to ask deeper when we don't understand the truth of the Bible. What's going on here? 
What's going on in here? Let's see if we can learn more from this. Jesus came to proclaim a new kingdom and to give us an invitation to a new way of life. But the people who heard it had to respond. And if you've been here for the last four weeks, every parable there is, should be a response of some kind, isn't it? And this one, just like the others, needs a response from who? From us. With that in mind, when we look at this parable, it brings some new light to what Jesus might be saying. And it gives us an invitation as well to what Jesus wants us to do. Will we hear that invitation? Will we respond to that invitation? Again, with that in mind, let's look at how Jesus explains this parable. And in verse 14, he continues, Jesus says, The farmer scatters the word. So the seeds are the word, the word of God. When he talks about the word, that's basically saying Jesus' message to the people and Jesus' message was God's kingdom is here. Come and follow me. Be a part of this kingdom. An interesting thing I didn't mention earlier was when the author of Mark wrote this parable, he used the same Greek word to describe where the people were sitting and listening to Jesus as the soil where the seeds landed. So he literally used practical props, sort of speak. And I don't think that was an accident from Jesus' part. And so Jesus carries on and he says, This is the meaning of the seed that fell on the pot. When the word is scattered and people hear it, right away Satan comes and steals the word that was planted in them. How many of you have had that happen? Huh? When God speaks the truth to you, you know it. You know that you need to respond. And something, somehow, Satan gets in there and brings a little bit of doubt. Can you really trust him? Can you really trust God? The snake saying to Adam, did God really say that? It often happens, isn't it? And here's the meaning of the seed that fell on rocky ground. When people hear the word, they immediately receive it joyfully because they have no roots. They last for only a little while. How many of you have been there? You've come to church, you've heard the word, or you've done a Bible study, you've heard the word, you've done your devotion, you've heard the word, and you think, ah, oh, this is great, but you don't spend time on that word, you don't have faith in that promise, and what happens? It doesn't last long. The joy just gets taken away. When they experience the distress or abuse because of the word, they immediately fall away. Often when people come to me for advice or for counsel, and I say what they know, I don't say anything new, but what has happened is that they've allowed the stress of life and the circumstances to take away the promise of God. Others are like the seeds scattered among the thorny plants. These are the, the, the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of this life, the false appeal of wealth and the desire for more things break in and literally choke the word. And it bears no fruit. The seeds scattered on good soil are those who hear, hear the word and embrace it. They bear fruit. In one case it says it healed uh, 30 to 1. In another case 60 to 1. And in another case 100 to 1. Those are good outcomes. Those are good statistics, isn't it? When you, bear, when you hear Jesus describe this parable, what is he focusing on? He's focusing on the soil and how the soil receives and responds to the seed because the seeds are made to grow. The Word of God must never go out in vain. The Word of God is a creating Word. 
It's a challenging word. It's a changing word. And if we don't hear the word and allow it to grow within us, what kind of a soil are we? I think it's interesting to note that in all of the soils, but one, the seeds grow. Because seeds are meant to grow. They're meant to grow. And if they don't, then something is wrong. I've been preparing, last year I've been preparing four boxes um, to plant vegetables in, in our garden. And for some reason the one just didn't, that there was nothing, like literally nothing. With all the rain that we've had, nothing is growing up in it. And I asked one of my friends that could test the soil, the acid in the soil and all of that, if he could come and bring his fancy equipment. And it turned out to be just clay. <laughs> literally just clay. And I know Queenstown often has a lot of clay around, but I thought I put compost in it and I thought it up. And right next to it, the same amount of time I spent on the other box, you know, our tomatoes are going to look really nice and red. Our spinach is going to be nice and full. Same soil, same amount of time that I spent. But on the one, the seeds just didn't grow. On the other, it did. This par parable isn't something that is trying uh, uh, something that is trying to tell us maybe the seeds uh, will grow or not grow. It's asking us, will you let the seeds grow in you? Do you, us, have the soil to help the seed grow and to let Jesus plant himself in you and grow and bear fruits in your life? That's the question that Jesus is asking then and now. That's what Jesus is asking with this. Are you going to let me plant my word in your life and let it grow and bear fruit in your life? Or will you just keep doing your own thing? One of the greatest things that I believe that COVID has done to the church is exactly that. We haven't toiled our ground. We haven't looked after our ground. How many times throughout COVID lockdowns we've heard, feed your faith, not your fear. What's that about? That's about watering your, gar your garden, your plant. Watering your soil, toiling your soil, making sure that your soil is ready for faith regardless of the circumstances and not the fear. But it's not just growth. Again, in all but one of the soil it grew. The goal is fruit. It's for God's word to, to come through us and bear fruit. But what is that fruit? Well, if the seed is the word of God's kingdom, the fruit will be living and reflecting that kingdom, isn't it? I mean, if you plant a tomato seed, you're hoping that a tomato is going to come out. If a cucumber has come out, then you plant the salad seed in there, haven't you? So when you plant the seed in the right soil, and you know it's that seed, you're expecting to see that fruit, not another fruit. And here's what that could look like. Maybe for you it means you have the ability now to forgive someone who has hurt you like never before. It could mean that the fruit could be, be able to love and care for that person who, who, who evokes differently to you. When we are the right soil, God's Spirit begins to grow in us and be fruit in our lives that change the lives of people around us. But this parable forces us to ask is not, will the seed grow? But will I let the seed grow in me and bear fruit? 
The seeds are meant to grow. Now I want us to, to take a look back at the parable and look at the explanation of each of the soils as we do that. I want you to ask yourself the question, which soil am I? In this season of my life, which soil, soil describes me best? I say season because life has seasons, isn't it? Our faith has seasons. And sometimes we feel if we are following Jesus, everything needs to be uh, training up right and, and, and going in the right direction. That's a hope. But oftentimes life happens and life is hard. And sometimes we sort of flatline, we plateau. But the hope we, we find in this passage is even when we do that, God continues to work. God's seeds continue to grow. And when Jesus gave his life for us on the cross and rose from the dead, his kingdom started to infiltrate every part of our world. And he wants to let us know that we need to carry on growing. If we let the seed grow, he will continue to let it grow and to bear fruit in our lives. So let's go a little bit back at the parable. Let's start with the very beginning with the seed that fell on the path. Jesus says, this is the meaning of the seed that fell on the path. When the word is scattered and the people hear it, right away Satan comes and steals it the word that was planted in them. Now the path, when we, I think about it, it's like we are set in our, in our ways, isn't it? And we are just not going to change no matter what. We're going to do what we're going to do. What this might look like in our lives is, I'm just here because my parents are making me come. And, and how often it is true for, for our kids, for our teenagers. I don't want to come here. I think church is boring. I think the minister is boring. I think these songs we're saying are so ancient. I couldn't even understand some of the words. And so I didn't want to come here. But my parents said, well, you have to come. Well, I'm just here because my spouse wants me to be here. I would rather sit and do whatever. But my spouse wants me here, so I come in order to keep peace in my marriage. We come and we feel like not connected. But I don't know if I can believe any of the stuff about Jesus. It might be something that you would say to yourself. So, so I'm just going to, to do my own thing. I listen, but I won't let really anything take root. I think about the path as being something where we show up. But then we go home and go back to our lives, our normal lives. Now if that's you, here's a challenge. Here's a challenge. I want to encourage you to take this week, take some time to ask questions for yourself. Take some time to think about what you are seeing or experience here and ask, is there something behind that? Is there something behind it? Yes, I might have been forced to come. Yes, I listen, but I don't really believe, and so I just do my own thing. But maybe just this week, ask yourself the question, is there something deeper in here? Start trying to learn and grow for yourself. I think the path can also show up in, in other ways. It can show up like this. I'm going to check the news headlines during, during, uh, um, I mean, during the sermon on my phone or, or after the sermon. Because I've heard all of this before, so I must just be on my phone. It's, it's old news. I've heard this parable preached a hundred times. Or maybe I'm not going to go this week because it doesn't get deep enough for me at church. I'm not, I'm not getting anything. From church. I know in my own life sometimes this will show up as saying I know where, where they're going so I'm just going to start thinking about what I have to do after this and not actually listen to what they say. 
you sort of switch off. Have you find yourself being that sometimes? Just be there, your body, mind maybe, but definitely not spirit. I honestly think that the path is one of the biggest dangers for lifelong <coughs> church attendee. Because we know a lot of things. We've been coming to church for years. We've heard a lot of things. And it can become so easy for us to numb and just check off the box and say, oh, well, I've attended church. But not allowed the word to sink in into our lives. If that's you, here's one challenge I will give to you. If that's you, if you feel that you've switched off for whatever reason, um, and you're hearing the word, but you're not allowing the word to really go in you, find someone to mentor. Find somebody for you to pour into and teach them about what it means to follow Jesus. You know, in the old days, in biblical time, when I heard a word, it says that the young men walked with the old men. And they would talk. What do you think they would talk about? The old man was saying to the young man, hey, did you hear what, what he said? So tell me, how, how's your week been? How, how, how are you going to implement this in your life? You know what, I'm going to pray for you this week. As, as we do with the family of the week, it's just nice just to make the family of the week feel good about themselves. Yes, I got chosen to be the family of the week. No. It's to say to you guys, we're here for you. Actually, we've always been here for you. All you had to do was just ask. When I ask people for three simple prayer requests, it's amazing. It's not that easy when you have to think about it, isn't it? Why? Because we stopped asking, especially of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Find someone to mentor and pour into the life what it means to prepare your heart to let God's Spirit grow in you and bear fruit. Our young generations are waiting for us to speak to them about the Word of God. But not in a condemning kind of voice. Not in a forceful kind of way. It's amazing that whenever I get invited to any of the schools in town to speak at assembly, how they're just waiting to hear the Word of God. And I can see it on their faces. you do that, I believe God will change you in ways you could have never believed. And that the thing you could do if your faith is feeling stagnant is trying to switch up your spiritual practice. Maybe practice what is being preached. Maybe you are someone who always reads the Bible. Maybe now you find it on an audio book. Change it a bit. Let it read to you. There's a lot of app on the phone now that you don't have to read the Bible, but it reads it to you. And there's some very famous voices that read it up to you. Maybe you need to do that. You will probably hear it in a new way. Find a podcast or, or one of the, the other well-known uh, uh, preachers. On, on There's so many stuff on Facebook. Uh, which are, is good stuff, so much stuff on YouTube, which is good stuff. It's not just, oh, well, I don't have a DSTV, I can't listen to TBN. There's more than TBN. I'm not knocking TBN, but there's more to that. Maybe start praying the Psalms. Try something to switch up what you pray and how you pray. The next one is a rocky soil. And Jesus says when people hear the word, they immediately receive it joyfully because they have no roots. They last for only a little while. When they experience distress or abuse because of the word, they immediately fall away. Maybe you heard a sermon that really spoke to you, or you got baptized and now you are ready to take the world. But then life hits and you look at the circumstances and just like Peter, you begin to sink. Maybe you lose your job. Maybe somebody close to you gets sick or dies. Maybe you have changed, but none of your friends have. So you are trying to live this different life, but they just don't get it. 
So they start pushing you away and you begin to slide away as well. For my own life, I can tell you that being in the rocky soil is one of the most difficult places to be. But it's also the time in my life when God has used it to really shape me and grow me like I've never been shaped and grown before. Here's something I want to challenge you to do if you find yourself in this place. Take a step to start digging, digging, digging deeper, deeper roots by connecting to community. By being a part of a community. The third one is a thorny plant. Jesus says, these are the ones who have heard the word, but the worry of life, the false appeal of wealth, and a desire for more things break in and choke the word, and it back bears no fruit. When I read Jesus' description of this one, it hurts, isn't it? Because you might think that you find yourself in this one more than, than any of the other ones. And here's what this could look like. This could look like you say, I want to join a Bible study group or, or get involved in church, but life is really, really, really busy. I want to start serving, but often time what happens is on the weekend. And the weekends are kind of my time. I want my family to make faith in my priority, isn't it? But I love church, but I really like what Jesus is saying, but, and it's full of those but, 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 but. If you find yourself saying to yourself, I want to be a part of something in the church, well, next Saturday, we're having our pop-up shop. Two ways you can get involved is one, you can bring more things for the pop-up shop. Another way is maybe you've never been a part of the pop-up shop and maybe you can't be there from half 7 to 12, half 12, 1 o'clock, but maybe you can come for two hours. That's something. But as long as we let life priorities take us away from us wanting to be a part of a church, wanting to be a part of a faith community, wanting to be a part of a study group, wanting to be a part of whatever the church is doing, as long as we say, yeah, but, you know, I would love to, but, yeah, I get it. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I want to spend more time with my family. I get it. There's a lot of excuses. But should our response not be, yeah, but, but rather, what if? What if I just give this much and then the next day I give this much? What if I try and balance my, my life and give enough time and schedule time to be with God and be with my family? Make that time a sacred time. Because you know what I find? The more time you spend with God, the more time you actually got for the other stuff. You know what? When, when, when the scripture says, seek you the first kingdom of God and all these things will be added onto you, that's for real. That's not just a nice quote. Because when you do seek first kingdom of God, everything else will be added onto you. Everything else. The final soil is a good soil. The soil we all hope that we are, aren't we? And Jesus says this, he says, The seeds scattered on good soil are those who bear the word and they embrace it. They make it part of it. And it bears fruit. And it's 30 to 1, 60 to 1, 100 to 1. The good soil is a soil that creates space for God's seed to plant itself into our land to grow and to bear fruit. How does it do that? Well, Jesus says two words. It hears and it embraces. You remember when you first learned how to swim? Well, if you don't know how to swim, you won't. 
but those who know how to swim, how, how you first learn how to swim, if you know how to swim, more than likely when you learned how to swim, the first step was to go for, to the pool, obviously. That's kind of important. The next part of that was you're at the pool and somebody's probably talking to you about what you're going to do once you get into the water. And once you understand that, you might have to slide yourself into the water or maybe they go in first and you second and they sort of, don't worry, you can stand, just put your legs down and, and you can stand. And remember as children, you learn how to blow bubbles, okay? And what is that monkey, you, you, you walk like a monkey on the side of the pool because you learn to not fear the water and where you can stand and where you can't stand and you put your head down and you blow bubbles and once you blow bubbles and you have mastered that you might go on to floating remember the floating when someone must might have taken you i remember i don't know if they had it here but in israel we had like these two strings with polystyrene blocks okay i mean it's absolutely ridiculous but it was these huge polystyrene blocks and there were two very thin strings and slowly but surely they will take one of the blocks away and before you know it you actually are floating with two strings <laughs> attached to you I don't know if they had these kind of things here or maybe you were a bit more fancy than, you, than in Israel but once you've got that then you start kicking and adding your arms and before you know it you're able to swim. The way they teach you is that, that they teach you one thing at a time. And you learn it, you embrace it, you apply it, and then you go to the next step. You learn it, you embrace it, you apply it, and then you now go on to the next step. And you become a swimmer. I think the same thing goes on in our spiritual lives. That's what it is going on with the good soil. Theologian Kylan Sondergrass describes it like this. He says, To be a disciple of the kingdom means hearing and remaining focused on the message of the kingdom in such a way that one becomes defined by it. The key to spiritual formation is a willingness to listen, to practice of the discipline of listening, and to respond appropriately to the words that are being received. So you hear, you embrace, you reply, and you take the next step. Step. I think Jesus says, if you don't understand this parable, you won't understand any of the other ones, because he wants us to know that when I'm speaking, what I want you to do is to sit with it. To think about it, to wrestle with it, but then keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. The people who were asking Jesus to explain the parable were the people who kept moving forward even though they didn't fully understand it. They kept chewing on it and asking, what does this mean for us? How do we apply this to our lives? And I think at the core of following Jesus is this idea of actually listening to what Jesus is saying, hearing it, and thinking, how do we apply this to our lives? When we do that, when we hear, embrace, and keep moving forward, God's Spirit digs deep into our lives and changes who we are and we begin to bear fruit. The good soil hears Jesus' words. It applies it to our own lives. And, get, and then God makes us grow. And God bears the fruit in our life. For 2,000 years, people have been hearing the good word about the kingdom. For 2,000 years, it has been taking hold in people's lives and transforming the way people have been living. And that's why we're here today. So this parable forces us to ask the question, which soil are you going to be? Which soil is our church going to be? This church. 
My hope and my prayer is that we become the good soil and that we let God begin to work in our lives to bear fruit. Let's pray. Lord, we love you so much. And we thank you that you are a God who invites us to really, really allow you to transform our hearts and our lives. And to plant your roots deep within our soul. Lord, help us to have the courage to ask those hard questions. Give us the eyes to see places where maybe we are being like a path or the rocky soil or the thorny soil. Maybe we should let you begin to plant your roots deep in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, we thank you that even if we aren't doing it now, you're a God who invites us to come to you and you would always do a new work in us. We thank you that your seeds are planted in our hearts and we await for the time in which they will grow and bear fruit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Right, let us stand and receive the benediction.